Fifteen miles from Jerusalem rests a sun-scourged plain, bordered by rocky mountains and perilous cliffs. In 1947, a Bedouin boy, while searching for a strayed goat, cast a stone among the cliffs into a cave. To his surprise, he heard the sound of shattering pottery. On this program, Zola Levitt examines the remarkable find taken from that cave, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Shalom, hello again. Well, we're back with uh, Dr. James Tabor, Associate Professor of uh, Ancient Judaism and Early Christianity, University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And uh, he's, he was our guest on a previous program uh, where you uh, heard of the Messianic uh, Dead Sea uh, texts. Uh, well, I still have my notes from that show. We, we talked about the slain Messiah text, the raising the dead text, the uh, Messiah and the light. And uh, Dr. Tabor is one of the, uh, uh, well, he's discovered uh, uh, texts, and he's one of those translating the now revealed but previously uh, suppressed Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, we've got uh, books here that are brand new and so on that we've been looking in, and I, I think we'll have... Uh, quite a lot to say about uh, this this startling new uh, development. Knowledge will increase in the end, said Daniel, and in this regard it really is. Back right after this. A trip to the Bible lands with Zola is more than just the luxury hotels, fine meals, and tours of the biblical sites. It's also an up-close look at ancient and modern Israel. We're in the area of Tel Marisha. We're excavating an underground cave system from the Hellenistic period, from around 2,300 years ago. Underground, some people are excavating, and the group that we're seeing up above here are sifting, looking for the smaller finds, for coins, for small shards, and things of that nature. You can talk about the Second Temple period, but when you're actually uncovering it, um, there's a dynamism there that's almost indescribable in words. You can see it on people's faces. This is far beyond anything I had dreamed of, of coming into a cave like this and really finding what people were using 2,000 years ago and touching it with my own hands and being the first person to have touched that since it was lost here. It's wonderful. Discover Israel, Greece, and Egypt for yourself. Writer call today for a brochure of Zola's upcoming tours. Dr. Tabor, thanks for coming back. It's good to be back. Um, I should mention that you were uh, cited in that original newspaper article that we uh, uh, read aloud on our program uh, when it came out, November 8th. The program was broadcast November 9th. You were one of the uh, people that uh, helped release these scrolls. Now. I've understood that something like 40% of these Dead Sea Scrolls, and these were found back starting 1947, exactly. mm -hmm. have been unpublished until now. Until last week. Until, until a week ago. Oh, boy, I'm mm -hmm. so grateful for you for coming at, at seeing mm -hmm. this. I really am, and, and disclosing these things. But why uh, did it take all this time? It's an amazing story. I'll give you a short version of it. Okay. Um, when, when Cave One was first discovered, the famous Bedouin shepherd boy who throws the rock in and hears the pottery and goes in, uh, there were seven complete scrolls found in that cave. They've all been published for years and years because mm -hmm. the Israelis had them. Mm -hmm. And they brought them out very quickly. You can see them in the shrine of the book. Mm -hmm. But uh, as other caves were discovered, 11 caves have have yielded scroll material. Uh, they, they were under the Jordanians. This is getting a little bit into politics, but you see mm -hmm. that area was uh, controlled by Jordan. Mm -hmm. So they went to East Jerusalem to the uh, Palestinian Archaeological Museum, as it was called. Have uh, you been to the Rockefeller? Yes, I've seen okay, it. Okay, mm -hmm. well that's the place. It was then called PAM. Mm -hmm. And they were put under a team of uh, Roman Catholic scholars mostly who had uh, worked at a coal biblic, the uh, a coal there, the school. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was one non-Catholic. No Jews worked on these scrolls. No Jews worked on no Jews scrolls. No Jews worked mm -hmm. on these scrolls. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. All the way up into the 60s. And essentially that team had the scrolls. They would uh, give them out to their students, to various people. And there was no way to get to them. Uh, I was too young to remember those days, but people older than I have died now. One of my uh, revered teachers, Morton Smith, uh, died this year at uh, Columbia University. He 
Never got to see the unpublished scrolls. Waiting a scrolls. lifetime to see Wait, scrolls never saw them. held by Palestinians and Roman Catholic <laughs> scholars of Jewish writing. Okay. It's, a, it's a strange saga. Uh -huh. Now, it was not until um, Father DeVoe, who was the first chief editor, said that they would all be, uh, all be out in 62, 1962. Uh -huh. How many years has that been? Almost 30 Almost years 30 ago. Almost 30 years. So uh, it hasn't happened. Eight volumes have come out, but the more interesting material from Cave 4, if any of your viewers have been to Qumran, Cave 4 is that very easy to spot, wide open cave, right as you're standing looking at the cliffs there. Uh, there were 800 fragments of scrolls found in that cave, and very little of that material came out until last week. The two texts we looked at on the previous program were both from Cave 4. Well, I can almost uh, infer from what you're saying that uh, somebody read these texts and said, I don't, I don't think we should release these things. There are all kinds of uh, conspiracy theories that have been proposed, uh, theories just about scholarly jealousies, who gets to have their name on these texts. There's been alcoholism involved, there's been uh, incompetence, there's been all sorts of things. We're it's, talking it's not about, a pretty story, boy, uh, 20. but everybody involved is not uh, the bad and everybody's not good, it's, but it's a mess. Everybody agrees it's a mess. Well, sure, and it is and, in the average office, too, yeah. but 20 centuries we've waited for this I'll give you an example. <laughs> the the uh, group of uh, other documents called the Nag Hammadi materials uh, were uh, found about the same time. You can get numerous editions now in English of all of the material. It was brought out rather quickly. And uh, with these materials, uh, it wasn't. So what happened, uh, in, in actually it took until the 80s, until the pressure really began to build. Mm -hmm. And Herschel Shanks, the editor of Biblical Archaeology Review, spearheaded a lot of this effort. But a uh, great deal of public pressure. The public got, began to get interested in the late 80s, if you recall. Boy, it takes a while. As the word got out, uh, people didn't know. 40% of the Dead Sea Scrolls aren't out. People began to say, well, I thought everything was out. What's not out? I did. I, you know, I, and, and you began to hear about it, and it, it, it built momentum. And uh, so I, I uh, had no idea. I would have, I would have marched with a, with a The poster. story I mean, is, <laughs> is literally like a mystery story. What happened, uh, finally, is that uh, Professor Robert Eisenman at uh, California State Long Beach obtained the photographs, uh, not through any uh, source that officially was given them. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we're not even sure if he hasn't told me for protection reasons. He, I'm not even sure he knows where they came from. But uh, he and James Robinson, the editors of this volume that we looked at on the previous program. Not the program. evangelist James Robinson, no, but James uh, Robinson. James Robinson, okay. who's a very, uh, very well-known uh, scholar uh -huh. uh, from Claremont School. Uh, just simply, I, could, I guess you could call this the bootleg edition. Mm -hmm. They simply put this out. This, these two volumes uh, bring us up to date. In other words, with, with these materials I have here that were already out, and these materials, all the material is out. The problem is this is still in Hebrew. It's still is raw material. It's got to be carefully looked at. You know, we've got years ahead of us. But at least any scholar now, I teach at a play, you know, I'm not at Harvard or Yale or Princeton. I'm at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. But I, too, can uh, begin looking at these materials. Oh, I'm very grateful, and, so, and we should uh, all be, to these people that finally got, got them out of, out yeah. of trunks and wherever and they And I were. think now, I, I just attended the American Academy of Religion meeting, which is the big national meeting of all mm -hmm. biblical scholars. And there was a general sense of relief these were being sold, and I think people were saying, well, finally, they're out, and whether whichever side we were on, the suppression side or the go slow side or the get them out side, it's over. They're out, and let's just go ahead now and see what they yeah, are. As, as though it were some, some mere uh, a product with a patent or something. That's I mean, right. this belongs to, to the whole world. This is the material for the heart. This is not a... It's uh, a very interesting question, who they belong to. Uh, okay, we already said they were discovered in 1947 on the West Bank, right? Yeah, Jordan. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So Jordan owns them, I suppose. Now this is odd if you think about it. What if some uh, very valuable Arabic manuscripts relating to the very birth of Islam had been found Until in the land of Israel? <laughs> And only Jews were looking at them. No Arabs were allowed to oh, look at them good until luck. the what do, you, what do you think would happen? Uh, President Bush and Secretary so Baker. Clearly, would, uh, this got very political. <laughs> but in the Six Day War, lo and behold, on June 7, 1967, guess what? The Israelis suddenly owned the scrolls. Why? Because they took over East they Jerusalem. They occupied the land. They okay. occupied the Rockefeller. Yeah. The scrolls are in the basement of the Rockefeller to this day. These photographs were made back in the 50s or 60s. Oh. 
you know, as a preservation in case of war oh, or destruction. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, so we have them. So now the Israelis own the scrolls, but the Israelis didn't want to rock the boat in terms of the, the team that had been working. There was patience in the 60s, a sense that, well, they've only had them for 15, 20 years. It, it's very technical. You saw how some of these fragments have to be pieced together. Give these men credit for the you know, hours of work they've spent. This stuff was brought in shoe boxes, if you can imagine, by Bedouins coming in. Here, here's a box of, DeVos said there were 15,000 fragments oh. sometime, uh, from Cave 4, literally almost swept off, off the floor. What, what goes with what? So we give them credit for that. But then as you go through the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, too slow. Uh, <laughs> some of this material, like uh, you, you see in here, a whole page, it doesn't need piecing together. It just needs publishing. Mm -hmm. Let people read it. Let mm -hmm. people look at it. Mm -hmm. So uh, who owns the scrolls? That's the question. I, I would say essentially humanity, right? All of us. But the Jewish people, basically. These I would are, say even the Jewish people first, then humanity. Yeah. These things are written That's in right. Hebrew. They're in they're Hebrew. About the Jewish and they relate prophets. to the very important period of what we call Second Temple Judaism. Christians call it the Judaism of the time of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, what more? It's the foundations of Western civilization. Of course it is. I mean, this material, <laughs> you realize without this, you know what we had? We had the New Testament. We had some rabbinic traditions, but the Mishnah and Talmud don't come until two or three hundred years later. Yeah. So as far as first century, we had Josephus and the New Testament. I wouldn't That's even, it. I, I, now we've got hundreds of additional uh, materials from that very period. Yeah, I, I would contest even the idea that the Jordanians own it because the Jordanians lived in that territory in, They owned in it at that time simply by right of But control. that was Jewish land. Why were the Jewish scrolls there? Because <laughs> the Essenes lived there. I mean, right, it's simply right. a proof that the West Bank was Jewish land. You there were no Jordanians there. You, you bring were. up, uh, <laughs> without becoming political, let me point out something that's kind of fascinating. Uh -huh. We should give this gentleman credit where credit is due. If you notice in the dedication of this volume, it says the Biblical Archaeology Society is grateful to the Irving I. Moskowitz Foundation, Moskowitz okay. Foundation, mm -hmm. for its general generous funding of this publication. Mr. Moskowitz was interviewed in the uh, Washington Post uh, uh, just two weeks ago when these came out. He said that he had marginal interest in the religious content of these scrolls, but he wanted to get these out. Because, in fact, as a Jew, he felt that Jewish texts found on the West Bank uh, should, should, should come out immediately of to, to uh, make the point. So it, it's an interesting... Probably point. should be said that all these things were written <laughs> and buried there in those caves before the first uh, six, seven hundred years before the first Muslim walked the earth. Exactly. So. Okay, so what's coming up in English? We can't study these. These are Hebrew. Okay, I, I want to show two volumes that your uh, viewers can get at bookstores. I, I, I'm ready to promote scroll interests. I think Jews, sure. Christians, everyone should discuss this material. It's fascinating. This is the Dead Sea Scrolls in English by Vermish. Uh, this is Penguin Press, readily available in most okay, bookstores. Okay, that's out. Yeah. And uh, that's got all the material in English. This is a, a similar version of it. You have two choices. This is Gaster's version of it mm -hmm. uh, with Doubleday Press. But I, I would suggest that people even start with this material. If, if any of your viewers have heard about the Dead Sea Scrolls, but they've never quite really seen them or mm -hmm. read them, mm -hmm. this is uh, material from the time of the New Testament, from the time of the ancient rabbis, mm -hmm. contemporary. Uh, you know, uh, begin maybe with the published material. Yeah. For the unpublished material, unfortunately, you're going to have to wait a while. However, Robert Eisenman and Michael Wise, the two men largely responsible for some of these materials, mm -hmm. are going to bring out a volume of 200 of what they consider to be the most interesting texts. Uh -huh. Obviously, that Messiah text that we discussed last time, in fact, both of the ones we did in your previous program will be in that, and I guess 198 others. Now, that will be ready in the spring. So uh, Pretty quick, I'll it? update you so that you can yeah. announce to your... And that'll be readable in English. And in so English. Forth. All right, we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, we'll, we'll say when those are, because we're going to do this right along. I don't think that there will be a time we're not doing it. Ed scroll from what you say. Looks like in other words, there will be a show all the time because you'll be doing new updates ones. And You're going over right. to Israel to dig in some more caves. You're going to find right. some more scrolls. Perhaps. Thank yeah. God that land come back to the Israelis. Um, 
What's the benefactor's uh, interest in the politics? I mean, does, is this going to change the end of time, or is uh, the Jordanians going to back up? Or what does it what does it mean politically? Can you interpret? I don't think it's having too much effect at this point. Uh, I think the benefactor was trying to make a, a point in the past, in retrospect, that uh -huh. that now at long last. Uh, you know, these materials are out. It wouldn't make a Jordanian uh, heart flutter a little bit to say, gee, these people are my neighbors and these yeah. that's really their scrolls. We should interview Jordanians and find out. <laughs> that might be an idea. By the way, in the 60s, Jews were added to the committee, slowly. Slowly but surely. And now yeah. there are and Jewish And now there are Jews on the committee. I that, should add that, just for accuracy. It's probably yeah. going to help. In fact, the head of the committee is, uh, is Jewish. Mm -hmm. But uh, it did take a while. Well, if I found some Mexican documents in the ground <laughs> in Arizona, I wouldn't call the Chinese to work That's on right. it. Uh, so. And uh, unfortunately, the early editors, this is a known fact, it was the front page New York Times, were openly anti-Zionist. Now, I think they would deny that they were anti-Semitic, but they were anti-Zionist. If you recall, the chief editor was removed just uh, not too many months ago. I read about that. Uh, for making statements that Judaism was a uh, fossilized religion, it should have disappeared long ago, and you know, so forth. Not very familiar with the Bible, uh, is he? Right. <laughs> and uh, even Father DeVoe was pretty well outspoken as a person who had never set foot in uh, Israeli territory or deal with Israelis in any way. So how that's do, part of do, the story. How, yeah, yeah. how can people by logic be chosen who are against the people who wrote the scrolls? I mean, down yeah. to the soles of their feet. I what not put his foot right, in Israeli yeah. territory. How would anyone choose him? Or did they choose him on purpose? Well, the Jordanians to... chose him, uh -huh. obviously. That so. sounds more like it. In order to bury the scrolls, maybe. Who knows? Okay, I don't uh, want to put you on the spot. Yeah. This is, it makes me angry, I can tell you. Well, you're Jewish, so you have the right to fume. Okay, <laughs> let's put it on record. <laughs> uh, who were the people, anyway, the Essenes who wrote the scrolls? The people say the Essenes. Uh, help us with who, who wrote yeah, the scrolls. Until, I, I don't want to put you off, but until this, this very important material from K4 comes out more, we, we've got so many questions. For example, before I saw that wounded Messiah text, I could have spun one theory, you see. And now I've got to also factor that in to any theory I might spin. Okay. What we can say and that's why I think uh, some of your viewers would like to see the things already in English, is uh, you look at this group uh, of, of so-called Essenes. Let's just call them the people at Qumran. Okay. And they're talking about a new covenant, preparing the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Sounds like I'm talking about the New Testament. It sure does. Uh, baptism, holy meals, they have a council of 12. You can just roll off these parallels. They're talking about a Messiah and so forth. So. The early idea was, well, these are probably Christians. You know, they are the early Christians. And yet, if you look at their legal material, good example, they say, for example, uh, if your beast falls in the ditch on the Sabbath or is giving birth on the Sabbath, you can't help it. Mm. The Sabbath, the Jewish rest mm -hmm. day. That would be breaking the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Jesus is quoted, as you know, in Luke, saying precisely the opposite. Which one of you would not help a beast? Mm -hmm. So clearly, I think you said this on an earlier show you did, Jesus, you cannot say that Jesus is a part of this community because he doesn't seem to share their worldview. You no, see. he wasn't legalist. No. Okay. On the other hand, he share he does not. What he shares with them is a set of ideas about the new covenant, the Messiah, the resurrection of the dead, the end of the age. Uh, you know, a world of ideas different from the people in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So these people are out in the desert. John the Baptist is out in the desert. Jesus is out in the desert. They share some common enemies and foes, and in that sense, uh, that's where we are. We, we have lots of parallels, but I think it's really jumping the gun to say these people were Christian in any way. I just simply say they were the new covenanters of Qumran. I don't draw, sort of personally, the, uh, I don't think Bible readers really do draw a distinction between Christians and Jews. Early Christians were Jews. That's all right, of these yeah. Christians were Jews. All the disciples, right. all the apostles yeah. were Jews. I'd rather think of them, if I may, as, as people who, upon hearing of the Messiah, like all of us, either chose to follow him or not follow him. Right. Those who followed him and didn't stop. And various messiahs of the period were... You know, the Essenes might have followed. Sure, uh, there's uh, Shammai, there's Hillel, there's, right. uh, there's uh, heroes of the faith a, a, a lot. But yeah. the ones who said uh, he answers Isaiah's Messianic prophecies, as you pointed out on the past show, seems mm -hmm. to me they were believers, but they wouldn't be called anything different. 
no. say by observing exactly. Romans. That Nobody was saying that they're Christians. Right? <laughs> some follow this Galilean, yeah. some follow this other and rabbi. And these are these Jews out in the desert. These Qumran Jews are Messianic Jews. We're just not sure all they thought about it, but they're exactly. Messianic in the sense that they're very interested in, as we saw in these texts and other texts, in the Messiah and who is the Messiah and what will he do and so forth. Yeah. So uh, they share a common heritage, I think. And you've been there geographically, it's striking. You stand uh, up around Jericho or along the Jordan River, look down. People sometimes say, I wonder if Jesus or John knew about Qumran. Were they blind? I mean, sure you know, of they course knew they knew about it. it. <laughs> uh, I think they didn't agree. I think uh, it's not unlikely that Jesus and John could be two Jews who broke from that community, sharing many of the ideas, but having a different view of the law, of the Torah, how to keep the Jewish law. Yeah, Jesus, clearly they're not uh, the same as Qumran. In terms of the Jewish law. Some of Jesus' critics said he ate with publicans and sinners. Uh, they would never come. They would never come. People at Qumran didn't eat with anybody. Paul would other. be the ultimate apostate uh, to go to the Goyim, the Gentile world. Sure, to these people. go over, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and yet, you've got all those parallels in terms of worldview. That's why it's interesting. It's like we're in the backyard of where early Christianity began, thoroughly Jewish, thoroughly Messianic, resurrection of the dead, all these doctrines that Christianity later. And adopts, we finally evolve a denomination that makes a priest who says, I won't set my foot in Israel. <laughs> amazing. It can happen. Just amazing. Yeah. Uh, just astonishing. Uh, okay, what now? Are uh, we going to get more scrolls now? We, I, I know, and you've told me you're going over there and you're going to take machines, you're going to look in some more caves, <clears> and I'm going to send my Israeli crew with you so that we can get a look what you're doing. But what do you predict? I. You know, you don't want to go predict you're going to find something, and the Bedouins have certainly, and others have sacked that land and tried well, to find Well, they've gone through things. the coast, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's never been done fully and systematically, and that's what uh, a team is now beginning to do, of which I'm a part. Professor Eisenman is head of it, Michael Weiss, Philip Davies uh, from Sheffield, England. It's an international team. And what we're going to do is systematically map and survey the caves with surface radar, it's never been done before. Mm. So you go in a cave and you don't start digging. That would be foolish. Uh, you try to find, first of all, if there's any particular reason to dig. This can give you a reading on up to three, six meters down what, what might be there. And doing it more systematically. Some of these caves, if you, you know, you drive around that area along the road, you'll see a little opening like this, Yes. which if you poked your head in, might be a large cave. Cave one, the first cave. Yeah. The original opening was small. The shepherd boy, you, you know, know throws his stone. rock in. Uh -huh. and, and yet uh, now if you go there, it's all open and you can walk in. So uh, I think, uh, like I say, I don't want to predict we will find this, but we're going, uh, we go every December between semesters. We take our students and we go for three weeks. Uh, people who are interested can sometimes participate. And, uh, you know, it's open, uh, like yeah, all on archaeological our own tours, projects. As, as right. we saw in the spot, we take right. our people That's on an right. archaeological dig so they can see what it's like. And uh, as time goes on, I th what, what's ahead? I, I have to believe that there's more material out there. Uh -huh. And the one thing we haven't found yet, we found Bar Kokhba letters. That Bar Kokhba was the, the Jewish Messiah, you know, of 135. We found the Qumran. You know what we haven't found yet? are copies from the early Jewish uh, Messianic followers of Jesus of Nazareth. We haven't found that yet. Oh, now, did well, that, that stuff completely <laughs> disappear or not? I don't think so. The I first think, church documents. I think when the war began, the Jewish war I'm talking about, not World War II, the Romans, we're talking yeah. here on Pearl Harbor Day, so I'm thinking of... Uh, uh, our, but when the war began um, in, in the first century, we have record that the Jewish believers under the leadership of Jesus' cousin, actually, Simeon, who was the uh, relative of, of Cleophas. Now, there's a bloodline there. James, the brother, had died and so forth. That, that they fled, and they went around the Jordan River, uh, is the tradition we have, up and down east and west bank of the Jordan, perhaps took stuff with them. I mean, this is an ultimate dream, but who knows? We have to keep looking. Oh, wouldn't this be wonderful. So, How would it change? Uh, let me speak to you as a Jewish person. Uh, for people that believe in Jesus already, more evidence is, is nothing surprising. They already believe. Right. 
but Jewish people, let's say. We've had Jewish people calling into our offices and writing into the program saying, why didn't the rabbis tell us these things? That is to say, uh, they've never read Isaiah 53. They never knew the Old Testament prophesied a man mm -hmm. exactly like Jesus. They didn't know the story of Jesus' answers to voluminous messianic mm -hmm. prophecy. Now, if you start getting letters out of the ground, I mean, I mean, copied mm -hmm. scrolls that could be carbon dated by disinterested chroniclers mm -hmm. of the day. They weren't believers in this, that, or the other. They simply mm -hmm. wrote down what happened and what they observed. Uh, and it comes out that, that uh, Jesus' historicity has greatly increased. Everything he did, even the resurrection, seems to have, have, mm -hmm. have been valid. How will that change Judaism? I think what the scrolls might do for both groups would be to get Christians to recover their Jewish heritage, which they've largely lost, uh -huh. and maybe Jews to acknowledge more, and many do, many educated Jews especially. My, the scholars I work with, this is passe to them, it's a given, is to acknowledge uh, that the earliest movement of Jewish Christianity, if you want to call it that, is a thoroughly Jewish phenomenon. It's not an aberration. It, it's, it's a form of Judaism in the first century. And ironically... And to take back the scrolls, to take back uh, Jesus as well. And uh, I think uh, both Jews and Gentiles, Christian or Jew, then need to meet together in a, a more common dialogue on these questions. <laughs> and in view of the... Uh, uh, as a scholar, even, I could say that. I, I think we're all for understanding. You know, if, if there's a Jewish text that talks of a slain Messiah, let's talk about that. If there's uh, this text or that text, I think we're in an age where uh, everything should become open. You're open-minded. There should be indeed. just yeah. absolute discussions of all these things. Now, my gosh, with stuff like this coming up, this is mm -hmm. dynamite. This is going to shake people up on all sides. I sometimes start my opening class in Christian origins at the university by saying, was Jesus a Christian or a Jew? And just pause. Most interesting. And then I say, uh, <laughs> for the next uh, 12 weeks, we'll be discussing this point. Good point. Uh, so, uh, Same question it's, comes it's, to it's me a, all the it's time. A <laughs> hard question to answer for people. They've never thought about yeah, it. But I also right. taught for six years at the University of Notre Dame. And uh, I think in that context, particularly, this is the cream of the crop in terms of Roman Catholic students, very good students. It's very hard for them, particularly, to think of Jesus as. Uh, a Jewish. Uh, James, I hate to cut you off at a point like this, but we'll have you back again. We have to uh, sure. wrap it up for now, and uh, we're going to send our crew with you. Thanks so much for sharing with us. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Good to be with you. Well, I don't know how to wrap up a show like that. It's so very interesting. Well, we're going to do a lot more. Uh, we're going to cover the Dead Sea Scrolls right on out. Uh, uh, if the Lord comes while we're still studying, believe me, uh, we'll, we'll have the programs on. Our offer is the uh, Levitt Letter Extra book in which we broke the first story. When the scroll was released uh, uh, November 8th, we sent out uh, by first class mail an LLX, that is the Levitt Letter Extra, dated November 8th. And our people had it on the 9th and uh, they read it. And We've gathered that article, plus all of them, for about the first year and a half in a book called Levitt Letter Extra Book, or LLX. It's $12. Get it at the uh, uh, post office box or call with your credit card. Help us fund these shows, if you will, folks. I appreciate that. And Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem.